Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 13th of February 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. With me today is Robert Barwick, Citizens Party Research Director. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, high drama in Canberra over cash ban and try telling Europe their experience is a tinfoil hat conspiracy. So firstly, high drama in Canberra over cash ban. Now, perhaps not unusual for Australian politics, but the yep. situation in Canberra at the moment is highly fluid, uh, where you've got all kinds of shifts happening across party, the usual party divides. Yep. You've got the seams of the coalition being tested. Um, you've even had uh, Labor joining with the Nationals across the floor to select a uh, contrary choice to the governments yep. for the Deputy Speaker. There's a whole lot of things going on which you intersected. But amidst all of that, um, you've just come back from there, of course, having been there to fight uh, the proposal of the government to yep. ban cash transactions over $10,000. But there was a high degree of attunement to this issue, even amidst all this chaos. No, for sure. There's the uh, When you consider that this bill could have been easily snuck through the parliament back in September, right? We've, the, uh, we saw it, we had a breakthrough last week that we announced on the show where they delayed the report by th um, three weeks. So we were, this was the second um, week of sitting of the first round the city first sitting period for the year um, that we were there for, and we had a lot of meetings with senators on the cash ban, right? Because the senators are yet to vote on it, and what we're seeing is total government disarray behind the scenes. We're seeing um, Labor um, like one of those, you know, scenes in a cowboy movie where someone's shooting at their feet and they're dancing, trying to avoid the bullets, right? Um, we're trying to figure out which way that which way to step, you know, and and it's and the bullets are coming from you know, the metaphorical political bullets, for those who, want, who don't like those kind of meta metaphors, the, the bullets are coming from the public making phone calls, right, and, 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 and they're dancing like crazy. Um, and and this, this is an issue where the government has been completely shown up thanks to the work that we've done over mm. quite a um, bit of time now. And there's a, we, we have never had a chance, a better chance, to stop a bad law as we have with this cash ban bill now, mm, right? Absolutely. Now, just go through the state of play among the various parties of where we stand in defeating and getting these parties to vote against this ban. Well, the state of play, I just want to explain before I give you the specific details. So in the last three days while I was there, um, there were meetings with 22 senators and MPs, mostly senators. Now, um, I was there with Dr Wilson Sy, the, the former APRA principal researcher, Dr. Sy and I met with eight people. Um, the, the independent economist John Adams was there, and he was there for one day, but he was a busy bee yesterday, um, whipping through the Parliament House. John has, because he's a former advisor, he has a, he has a different past than we do. He has a lot more access. We have to wait for appointments. Um, John had 14 meetings in one day, right? And he was, he was really exhausted by the end. But um, what the, the consequence of these meetings was we, we gleaned a lot of intelligence for where things were at and advance the case a lot, right? People were meeting because they know this is an issue. It's, it's ringing in their ears, literally, because of the phone calls, right, that they've been getting. Um, and, and, and now we, 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 we can see the, the lay of the land and where things are. So what we've got is a number of, of the crossbencher parties have come out emphatically against it. So the original ones were Qatar and One Nation went first. We're totally opposed to this. The, 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 the most significant one now is the Greens. And the Greens statement, they, they put out a statement the other day, they're now replying to people. They've come out forcefully against this and it's a very good statement that they've made against it. They said that it's a case of the cure being worse than the disease. Yes, spot on, right between the eyes. And then, then they said if the government's serious about tax evasion and money laundering and they have a list of things it would do, right, and these are things that are no, literally no-brainers that this government refuses to do because it's not serious, they're trying to, the, the, they've used the black economy as a pretext here. So the Greens have finally come to this position, it's a very good one. Um, uh, Centre Alliance is, you know, their Senator Rex Patrick did the best job, or one of the best jobs along with Alex Gallagher in the hearings of, of showing up how bad this, this uh, uh, law is. Um, I think you got a quote from him as well. Yeah, Rex Patrick said that the benefits of the cash ban were not clear but the problems with it were... That's right. So, but, but because he's on the committee, most likely, 
their, their, their real stick was for procedure and they're going to wait until the report is official on the 28th of February before they announce their position, right? But everything, all of Rex Patrick's body language is, is, is uh, in a certain way. Um, the, the, uh, it, it does come down to the Labor Party, but before, before I get to the Labor Party, um, the, the Liberals are fascinating now because uh, of, a, of a couple of things. One is the, is the dynamic with the National Party. They're, they govern yeah. in coalition and they need that coalition in the Senate and in the House, they need it, right? And the thing with, this, with the Nationals and this rebel group under Barnaby Joyce, a lot of them were against the cash ban and forcefully so in the joint party room back in September, yeah. right? So now there's a, there's, a, there's a live sense, well, hey, they're threatening to cross the floor on certain issues. Um, if they're going to cross the floor on something, cross the floor on this. And this is what people who have National Party MPs and Senators call them and demand, you know, put your money where your mouth, with, mouth is, cross the floor on this. Now, the Liberals know that, and that's, that's, that's chaos for them. Plus, they themselves have started, the, all the backlash they've received from the public, from their own party members especially, is starting to sink in. So what we've had really good mail that the that the um, the Liberal MPs and senators from Victoria here, where that mega vote took place in November against the cash ban, 95% against it, they are actively lobbying the government to drop this bill. Mm -hmm. According to the news, some of the news reports that have come out, even the minister, the assistant treasurer Michael Sucker, has lost his enthusiasm for this bill. I want to say something about that though. Sucker, it turns out. Um, like too many people, before he got into Parliament, he worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers for a year and then at Blake Dawson Waldron, which is a law firm, as a, in taxation for a year. Now, those big firms, he worked in taxation. They're not helping small business look after their tax affairs. Their tax, they do taxation for the big corporations to help them minimise their tax. Right. So, in other words, Sukkah's part of the out of the, the, the milieu of people that, that wanted to cook up this this thing to b blame it on the on the, the small guy when the problem with the black economy and tax evasion is the big guy. But even he, with that background, has has lost enthusiasm for this. Apparently, what needs to happen now, though, with the national? One thing we can do with the, now, in a sense, we've we've sort of, we've sort of given up on the Liberals saying, well, it's their policy; it's up to Labor to stop it, and it's up to Labor to stop it. But there is a chance with the Liberals um, that. The some of the people in the Liberal Party and National Party are now demanding a second meeting in the party room. Mm. They had a meeting back in September where they basically were said to have endorsed the law, but all the evidence came out since then about how bad it was. They need a second party room. That, if that happens, that might be sufficient for the, the Prime Minister. A lot more people will speak out against it, and the Prime Minister might say, OK, we're going to mm. pull it. And finally is Labor. It does come down to Labor, though. Forget, you know, they can't rely on these shenanigans with the government. Labor does not have a, a uh, top-down coordinator of their position. It's, it's literally all over the place. Some of them are fiercely opposed, fiercely, and that's really good. But others, are, like I said, they're dancing around. We need, what's really crucial here is to keep the calls going, right? The calls and emails, but especially the calls to Labor MPs to tell them you must oppose this bill, or if you vote for it or find a way to pass it through amendments, it's your bill. We're going to hold you responsible, and they hate that. Right? They like doing deals and say, oh, that's the government's legislation, don't hold us responsible. No, you're the opposition. You're not, you're not put, voted in there to vote for government legislation. If it's bad, stop it. Don't try and find a way to pass it because you too have friends in Price, Waterhouse, Coopers and KPMG and the big banks. Right? So you've got to be brutal on them. If they vote for it, they will be held responsible for it. Mm. And with the Liberals... The call them all. All senders call them in the major parties. Liberals, Nationals, Labor. And with Liberals and Nationals, tell them you've got to have another party room. Yeah. yeah. Right? And ask the Meeting. Labor Party, what's your position? Why haven't you decided you're against this yet? You know, yes. hurry them up because they're taking their time on something that's quite clear cut. Uh, and just to mention um, what you were talking about of the Liberal Party and the coalition and the, the creaking that's going on at the seams there, the Sydney Morning Herald on the 8th of February had an article about this. We'll put that up on the screen, which stated that ministers are facing a torrent of criticism from Liberal and National MPs, as well as party members who believe the crackdown on cash is a breach of the government's stated belief in the free market. The division set up a clash in the Senate that could veto the bill unless the government acts on demands from its own MPs to abandon the reform or send it back to department officials for extensive changes. But we have to be clear. Uh, end it, don't amend end it. it. Don't amend There's it. nothing good about this. No, exactly. So call Labor, say you must vote against this bill. Call Nationals, say cross the floor, 
Call Lib will say, have a second party or a meeting on it, right? And within a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have a much better idea where we're going. But, they, but it, all, this, all the effort we've put in the last few days, all the people willing to meet, all the, all the drama that happened, happened in the context of a parliament that's dancing because of those mm. incoming, that, that the, the incoming calls, the incoming fire from the public, right, who are, putting, who are act, actually activating. Uh, you, you've heard me say it a million times, it works, keep mm, doing it. Yeah, and it's also provoked, following on from the Sydney Morning Herald coverage, finally a little bit more media coverage, though by no means enough. Um, so 3AW have covered it. Uh, New South Wales Radio did an interview with our State Secretary of New South Wales and Chairwoman Ann Lawler uh, that was in Taree. The Daily Mail had coverage, the New Zealand Herald, My Business and various other prominent blogs. And there's been quite a lot of letters to the editor too yep. that various activists had submitted, including in the AFR. And, the, and, and that reminds me of one more thing that, that I, I, I do need to say. There was... Um, Regular viewers might remember we told people to go to mem members of parliament with delegations. There was one, I won't single out the MP, but there was one um, before Christmas where the MP sort of thought he knew more about the bill than the delegation. And he's, he's supposed to, right? So that's not surprising he thought he did, but he made all these claims about it. He told them they didn't know what they were talking about. He made all these assurances about the bill. And, and we got this report back to us from the people who went along. That MP was met with this week. And when... In the discussion, when it was mentioned in passing that this bill involves two-year jail terms for spending your own money, he said, what? You can go to jail for this? I didn't know that, right? And he voted for it in the House of Representatives, right? This is so, <laughs> this is nuts. They, 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 your, your calls are not just to provide heat to them, is to provide information mm. to them as yeah. much as anything. So mention that right? among other things. Yeah. All right, we've got to take a quick break. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing try telling Europe their experience is a tinfoil hat conspiracy. And this is referring to statements made by Senator Jane Hume. The one and only <laughs> Senator for Bankers, Jane Hume. <laughs> so this was her. She's, so, she's as consistent as Satan, let me put it that way. <laughs> This was her way of dismissing the cash ban of a conspiracy. And we'll get to that in a moment. But as we said in the first segment, um, since various parties determined their position, such as the coalition government, on the cash ban, a lot of evidence has emerged that there is no evidence <laughs> for the need <laughs> of the right. cash ban uh, and that no due diligence has been done on what the impacts of it would be. And um, Dr Wilson So, whom you just have been in Canberra with, put together an excellent document which summarises this for the benefit of the MPs, which shows that there is, one, insufficient evidence that the black economy is a significant problem. It's well, all based on guesstimates. The title was, was very good. Cash Restriction Bill Lacks Legitimacy, Evidence and Consent. Mm -hmm. Wilson, Wilson is a beautifully succinct. Yes, yes. He condenses it down. Yeah. Um, he shows that there are no net benefits that have been shown to this bill, as many people have acknowledged in the, here, the two hearings that have taken place that it locks people into the banking system. And we've talked about debanking as well it last gives, week. That, you had a show that, on yeah, that. It gives banks, his point is it gives banks enormous power over people because once you're locked in and they have the power to debank you, they can ruin you, your economic life. Mm -hmm. And finally, that there was no regulatory impact statement which is required for all bills and uh, in the interest of the people had a sh whole show on that too which you can watch for more detail. And this includes the impact on businesses being forced to comply with all these new rules yep. which is going to have to change all their procedures, retrain people and I can imagine I, being I'll tell, you how important, I'll tell you how important the hearings were because I, the, the last meeting I had before get, hit, getting on the plane a few hours ago was with a very, very smart senator. I mean, he's super sharp, right? But he's, and, and he's, he's actually opposed to the bill, but he played a little bit of devil's advocate genuinely. He, wanted, he said, he said you, who uses cash anymore? Why is, you know, why is, is there really going to be a cost? It was a genuine question. And of course, the hearings showed, yes, there is going to be a cost, right? But there's an assumption because of electronic money, et cetera, that's, you know, it's, what, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal mm. that, you know, people have become disconnected to. And when the Treasury's Patrick Bonham was asked about this in the February hearings, he tried to use the same excuse that he used 
last late last year in the December hearings that uh, you know, he was asked, why did you only have about three paragraphs very briefly? That was supposedly your impact statement, which it wasn't, clearly. But he tried to use the same excuse that, oh, you know, um, th because it's the black economy, it's all hidden. But how yeah. can you use that excuse for making companies comply with different procedures? It's that None of that is hidden. It's all quite obvious you that they're going to have to change yeah. all their procedures and do things different ways. They have to make sure it's concrete ahead of the bill coming in. So why wouldn't the Treasury be forced to do that too? So it's just complete sleight of hand in ignoring this reality. Um, now... We want to come to Jane Hume's comment, but just to preface it, uh, Kimberly Kitching, of course, who took the lead... Ooh, she's the Labor senator. Uh, she took the lead from Alex Gallagher when he could, wasn't available for the 30th of January hearing into the cash ban bill. Um, she really seized the ammunition that's been available, and we'll put her tweet up in the, on the screen where she pointed out that there was no regulatory impact statement. She pointed out the opposition from the Liberal Party and, of course, she did actually read out in those hearings yep. the text of that Liberal State she Council motion. She took great motion. pleasure in doing that. Yep. Uh, and she pointed out there's no evidence for the need for criminalisation and two-year jail terms. Uh, now, Jane Hume, the Senator for Bankers, went along to a Liberal Party meeting. Here in Victoria, she's a Liberal Party Senator from Victoria, and they have monthly meetings. And this is the same crowd, that 95% of whom it, yep. voted against this. And she, at that event, completely dismissed any concerns about the cash ban bills as tinfoil hat conspiracies. Yes. So that's what we're talking about. And of because course, they raised with her cash bans, negative interest rates and bail-ins. Exactly. And that was her so those three things are just conspiracies. Well, we want to take a look at the European experience because... It ain't no conspiracy. It's there in black and white for anyone who cares to do the research and just a few internet searches. Um, so the negative interest rate policy, first of all, it was started from 2014 in Europe. And for average um, banks, it is a great expense for them because they have to keep their deposits with the European Central Bank and they're being charged to do that. And so they pass on some of those costs, but up until recently, they only passed on a negative interest rate to commercial bank accounts and to very large retail bank accounts. That's beginning to change where a lot of them are now passing it on to any retail bank accounts that have over 1 million euro in it. And it's gotten worse since the European Central Bank put a further interest rate cut in place in September last year, which went from a negative 0.4 to negative 0.5% rate. And some bankers have said, look, the floodgates opened at that point. Um, European banks, just to put it in context, are spending over 7 billion euro a year to park their deposits with the central bank. So while most banks in European countries, from Denmark to the Netherlands, Switzerland, France and Italy, are only passing on these negative rates to customers that have over a million euro. That's now beginning to change. UBS in Switzerland dropped their rate to negative 0.5 on accounts of 500,000 euro or over. And, and just so you know, if, you, if, you, if you're being charged a negative rate, the depositor it has no... What's the point of leaving your money there? Mm -hmm. right? this, is, this is why cash bans have to come in because when, the deposit will go, well, I'm going to pull my money out. And when you know the banks aren't particularly safe at the moment exactly, anyway exactly, with a global exactly. crisis looming. And UBS put even larger uh, negative rate of 0.75 on the bigger accounts. And now in Germany, which is the hardest hit because they hold a third of all excess European Central Bank deposits, Germans save double of what other European countries save. Uh, and several banks in Germany are now charging a negative 0.5% rate on any new account that is opened of any amount. So if you deposit one euro, you'll get charged that. Uh, and others are putting them onto existing accounts of over just 100,000 euro. 60%, according to a central bank study, are charging negative rates on corporate deposits and over 20% are charging negative rates on retail deposits. So that's what depositors are facing. But we've got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing tinfoil hat conspiracies, apparently. Um, we've just talked about negative interest rates, which are very real as the average 
depositor in Europe knows. And now we want to quickly talk about cash bans and bail-in, but just so you know, there's more detail in our Australian Alert Service, so call in for a copy if you haven't already to check it out. Um, now we'll put up on the screen uh, this graphic here because the negative interest rate policy in Europe was preceded by or accompanied uh, by cash restrictions in 17 Eurozone uh, nations that range between 500 Euro to 15,000 Euro. And this first graph is a timeline showing how this was clearly a response to the global financial crisis, yep. uh, as is bail-in. So it's part of a whole new um, strategy to save banks in the coming crisis because they knew they only put it off. Don't make banks behave better. Stop speculating and gambling with our money doing dangerous things. No, come up with strategies to keep propping them up at our expense. And this second graph here shows uh, all the countries which are on the left there in the blue which have cash restrictions. The green in the middle is the Netherlands which have to have declaration obligations to declare certain amounts and the orange ones on the right don't ha yet have cash bans. And I'll just mention that the European Commission did do a study in 2017 on implementing a European Union wide cash restriction. Uh, which they haven't accepted at the moment. They say they've got no plans to legislate it. But they did a very thorough impact assessment, I might say, which showed the extensive impact on the yeah. business and community sector. And they did surveys showing 95% of people rejected the proposal. Um, and, they, and they also showed, as you can read more in the alert, that it wouldn't have much of an impact on terrorist financing and tax, tax fraud and so forth. Uh, and that much of tax evasion doesn't depend on cash That alone should be something the Australian government pay, pays attention to. Here's Europe, done a big study, Europe-wide, and although the, some individual countries in Europe have done this, the European Commission has looked for, for Europe, because they've got a single currency, and said, no, nah, mm -hmm. won't work, we're not doing it. Now, as for bail-ins, the so-called conspiracy of uh, banks confiscating depositors' money... And, and this is one that I've personally had a chat with Senator Hume about, Elisa? Yeah, so they've been already carried out in Greece, Spain, Cyprus, the Netherlands, Slovenia, the UK, Austria, Italy, Portugal and Denmark. And It'll I might, never happen here. Might be missing some. Oh, as uh, Tom, no, Tom Elliott said in response to Malcolm Roberts on radio two weeks ago in Australia, here in Melbourne, he said, oh, that'll never happen in a Western country. And I believe that list you just read out was pretty much exclusively Western countries. <laughs> And uh, there's a whole series of places where it was used before the European Union brought in their official regime, bail-in regime, where the European Union, the Troika, were forcing countries into this action um, where people were completely unaware, uh, for instance, um, preferential shareholders in the case of Bankia in Spain who lost 100% of their shares translated into... Um, they were translated into just common shares which lost all of their value. Uh, and in Italy, where a lot of people hold bank bonds which are just like deposits. And so there's been a lot of um, conflict between these countries and the EU over this because it's wiped out the economy. In Cyprus, for instance, there was a 25% collapse in electricity usage after it was utilised. You've had runs on the banks which have provoked the European Union to introduce a pre-resolution moratorium tool so they can freeze bank accounts if a bail-in is about to happen to stop people pulling out their money ahead of the, the bail-in, I should Alyssa, say. I think, I think you've made your point. People have to call in there for more. To get the, you really do need to read the details of this, but the bottom line is this. When, when Liberal senators like Jane Hume, the Centre for Bankers, calls this stuff a tinfoil hat conspiracy, they are covering up for a real conspiracy, and it's what the banks are involved in with the government to fleece us to keep their system going. That's why we've got to stop the cash ban. That's why we've got to um, stop bail-in, etc. Yep, so call your Member of Parliament. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks for tuning in, and join us again next week.